Okay, recording is on. Let's uh, pray and um, get started. Thank you. Let's um, pray. I'll just pray and then we'll start. Father, we thank you for another day, another opportunity to get together and learn, share our thoughts, uh, explore ideas, and be equipped, God, to serve you, to serve your kingdom, to serve your people. Uh, we pray, God, that uh, the learning that happens today will be anointed by the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God will be a teacher and will impart wisdom, will impart understanding for us, and uh, help us do well as we serve you. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, hey, good morning. Uh, everyone, welcome to VC310, Church and Ministry Administration. And uh, let me go ahead and share our uh, post notes that we're using as a reference, and we will get started. So last week, we just introduced lesson number four, which is um, church and ministry organization structure. So we just started talking about organization structure. So basically we're saying we're putting the right people in the right place, giving them the right roles so that they can all do the work together and we can function uh, as an organization. So we can't just tell people, okay, come, 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 join, do whatever you want. We are all in ministry, be happy. <laughs> we can't do that. Uh, because then people will not know what exactly to do. You know, what am I supposed to do? What is my responsibility? And what is the other person's responsibility? No, there, there won't be clarity on those things. So it's very important to have an organization structure. And we also covered uh, some, some typical organizational structures. We said we can have something that's very functional, that is, the structure is along functional lines, what people do. Or we can have it around divisions. A division could be, you know, it could be different things. It could be department-wise, it could be geography, north, south, east, west, central. Uh, divisions could be, so they could be based on region. Uh, so uh, it could be based, you know, uh, like I said, bu business units or departments or things, territories, things like that. Uh, so divisions could be based on different things, but organization is built around divisions. Or for us in church, we would say around ministries or departments. Uh, the organization could be a flat structure. So we recommended last time it's good that the organization be as flat as possible. But we don't want so many levels. You know, you report to that person, that person, report to that person, that. <laughs> so by the time, if you have so many levels, by the time information goes up and down, it will be a lot of delay. So the flat it is, uh, information can flow very easily. Things can happen fast. And also we talked about a matrix structure, which is a kind of a mix between uh, the the vertical and the horizontal. You, try to, you know, there's a flow of information both ways, horizontally across departments, across functions, and vertically across uh, leadership levels. And so, so you have a good matrix. And so, ideally, we want an organization that is as flat as possible and as open as possible. That means information. People can, from different departments, just interact as they need. You know, so somebody from publications can go and talk to somebody in IT and or in media or whatever, and then they can interact freely with each other. You know, it's not like if you want to go to that and talk to somebody in that department, you have to get permission from this one and permission from this one and then go and talk. You know, so we don't want so many uh, intermediary steps just to have a conversation, whether horizontally or vertically. Right? So we want to keep things as efficient as possible. And one of the things we uh, 
used as a reference last week is how David himself organized. Right? So let's go in our Bibles to First uh, Chronicles chapter twenty-three. So David was, uh, you know, was a great king. He he under David's um, rule, not only did Israel subdue all their enemies, but also uh, they were really established as a nation. He brought in um, a lot of structure, order. You know, Saul, though Saul was King Saul, was the first king. It was his successor, David, who really established the kingdom, made it strong. And part of, and of course, he fought many battles. He had many victories. He overthrew many enemies. He extended the, the borders. Uh, all that was, you know, he had a great army. He did all that. But another major part of David's rule was he brought in a lot of structure, a lot of order, and how things must function in a kingdom. And if you think of it, he was actually a shepherd boy. He was actually somebody taking care of sheep. And to come to this level, to be a king, and to administer a kingdom so efficiently is truly the work of God. You know, David said, the Lord made me understand by his hand upon me. That was David is saying, actually, all this intelligence, all this understanding was what God gave me by his hand upon me. It was not something he learned. He didn't go to any business school or he didn't go to any you know, big uh, trading place. Nothing. He was an uh, ordinary shepherd boy. And God had raised to be king. But it was so amazing how he organized. So we just look at some examples of, uh, of how David did this in First Chronicles chapter 23. Um, it, and we, we are not going to read you know, all the verses. I just want to highlight certain things. Um, you could see, uh, and, I, I, and we're only looking at one part, which is how did he organize the tabernacle? But actually, if you study Chronicles, uh, First Chronicles, you'll see he organized his army, he organized uh, his kingdom, and he also organized the tabernacle. So we're only looking at the tabernacle, right? But you can see he had a very organized army, you know, very powerful, many strong generals, you could say. Like we would call them generals or, you know, army officials. They had many such people. But they're only looking at the tabernacle now. So First Chronicles 23. So it says, uh, when David was old and full of days, uh, he made Solomon king. He gathered all the priests. Uh, and the Levites were about, this is First Chronicles 23, verse 3 onwards. Uh, he gathered all the Levites, 30 years and above. Um, and of these, 24,000 were to look after the work of the house of the Lord. So 24,000 Levites, you look after the house of the Lord. 6,000 were officers and judges. 4,000 were gatekeepers. 4,000 praised the Lord with musical instruments. 4,000 musicians, which, uh, which are made to David for giving praise. So just think about it. He's organizing. Okay? He's selecting all the Levites, 30 years and above. Come. We're going to organize ourselves so that we can serve God properly. We're not just coming here, okay, everybody do something. No. All of you, from 20, uh, 24,000 of them okay, uh, to work in the house of the Lord. How did he put them? There were 6,000 officers, judges, they're taking care of uh, you know, administrative work, gatekeepers, taking care of uh, moving of movement of people. There are 4,000 musicians, verse, four, verse 5, sorry. Think about that. Then, verse 6. David separated into divisions or the groups, the sons of Levi. So even them, he put them into groups, 
and he had different groups of people and you know all these names are here then he arranges the priests that's verse 13 uh, and and uh, and then he puts them all into you know how they should come and worship god so we go to chapter 25 you'll see chapter 25 first chronicles 25 verses 1 to 8 notice how, what how he organizes them verse 1 moreover david and the captains of the army separated for service some of the sons of asaph of haman and Jedidin, who should prophesy with harps stringed instruments and cymbals the number of skilled men performing their service was and then you find the different things so he had three main you would say like worship leaders asaph haman and jedutin top like you say we would may, we maybe we'll call them worship pastors you know main people you are going to prophesy and sing with musical instruments but under you you're having all these people right so it says verse 2 uh, uh, second part of verse 2 the sons of asa were under the direction of asa who prophesied according to the order of the king verse 3 the under the direction of the father jeduthun the sons of jeduthun who prophesied with a heart to give thanks and to praise god and then verse 5 all these were the sons of him and the king see and the words of god to exalt his horn verse 6 all these were under the direction of their father for the music and the house of the lord with cymbals stringed instruments and harps for the service of the house of the lord right? then it says yeah so basically verse 7 there were 288 song leaders so three three you can say worship pastors asaph Jeduthun, Haman, under them all their people, totally 288. Think of it, 288. These are people who are going to sing prophetically. He had 4,000 musicians, 288 singers under these three leaders who are going to sing prophetically with their hearts. They organized them. And then he says, verse 8. They cast lots for their duty as a small as well as the great the teacher with the student and then you see they were all how many you you see the 24 slots till verse 31 if you look at first chronicles 25 verse 9 to 31 there were 24 groups every hour one group worship one one hour so this is very organized where in the worship of god you know so we are just looking at one part of how he organized that when you come into worshiping god yes there is uh, the holy spirit is moving yes god is leading us but we look at the example of david he organized them so well and, and these are big numbers of people, 4,000 musicians, 288 singers. And then you come in, 20, there are 24 groups. Every group come and you do your part. Very organized. So um, just example. And of course, even when he then, first Congress 28, when he starts building the temple, he goes about it in a very organized way. Um, and uh, yeah, let's go to 1 Corinthians 28. I wanted to point out those verses where David says, you know, all this was given to him by God. 1 Chronicles 28. If you look at verse 11 and 12, uh, as, as David uh, prepares for the temple, he says, Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, its house, its treasuries, its upper chambers, inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat, and the plans for all that he had by the Spirit. Verse 12. First Chronicles 28, verse 12 says, The plans for all that he had 
by the Spirit. That means, uh, how did David plan the temple? Solomon built the temple, but David planned for it. And it says, the plans were given to him by the Holy Spirit. Right? And then you'll also look at verse 19. After he explains the plan to Solomon, he says, all this said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the works of these plans, all the details of these plans. So he's saying, David is saying, the Lord made me understand. Uh, the Lord is the one who gave me this wisdom to put these plans together. You know? So uh, we can see, and I'm just looking at one example where how David organized, he created what today in modern you know, in modern terms we say he had a good organizational structure to have worship in the temple. And he had a good blueprint to build the temple. Okay, he was not a businessman, he was not an architect. How did he have the knowledge? David said, The Lord by his Holy Spirit made me understand. Okay. So the point is this, that even when we are thinking about organizing, planning, remember that the Holy Spirit will help us to do that work well. Yeah. We can't say, oh, uh, the Holy Spirit only helps us in preaching and teaching, organization, planning, and all we don't want. That is all earthly, human work. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit anoints. The Holy Spirit gives wisdom even for such things. And so that we can do it well. And it will be for the glory of God. It's right? so a beautiful example in David. So, so let's move on. Let's talk some other things here. So why must we have a well-designed organization? You know, so why you know why can't I why can't I just say okay everybody do what you want feel free happy why why must we think about this why must we you know really pay attention to having uh, some an organization that is well designed you know here are some reasons so that responsibilities can be clearly assigned and that will make sure that there is no confusion between the roles and there is proper coordination. So people know, whom should I go to if I want to get something done? Who shall I ask? You know, I go to the right person. That's, uh, and we can coordinate. Uh, we can also uh, ensure communication. Uh, ideas. We can share ideas, skills. We can make quick decisions. That means uh, people can, you know, who are the responsible people? We can make the decisions. Uh, we can be efficient and productive in our work. And also, we can have a healthy work environment so that there's no stress or conflict thing between you know people who are working. So all these are benefits of having a well-designed organization. If we don't have it, then there'll be a lot of confusion. Coordination will, will be lacking. People won't know whom to go to to get uh, to make decisions. Uh, organization will not be productive, efficient, and some, and very often the people will be under a lot of stress and uh, there'll be a lot of conflict. So, the organizational structure and design, it must be intentional, it must be systematic and planned. It should not be haphazard, it should not be driven by politics and people wanting position, power, this, that, you know. Those would be the wrong ways to design it. So somebody will come and say, no, I want to be the leader. Oh, you want to be a leader? Okay, I'll make a position for you. I'll make you a leader. Simply you give that, you know, create something, make him a leader or her leader. Has no purpose, no meaning, right? So it's not, it is It is very intentional, very systematic, planned. It's not haphazard. It's not to make somebody happy or, you know, driven by politics and things like that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it must be as flat, simple, and clear. I don't make it too complicated. Keep it simple. And it must be continuously improved. You know, that means uh, just because we had a structure, a certain structure, say, six months ago, doesn't mean it's going to remain the same. Right? We, can, we can reorganize. That means we can change the structure. Right? 
unlike a physical building, this building is set in stone. Yes, we can renovate it, but to renovate it is a lot of work, right? Uh, to break down walls, put down, it's a lot of work. But unlike this physical building, an organization is basically people and roads. So it's more easy to change, right? Uh, uh, and the reason we change is uh, maybe if we change it, we can perform better. We can make things more efficient. Or maybe there, there is a new need, uh, a new ministry area. Now, um, uh, Things like that. So there are many reasons, good reasons, genuine reasons, for us to reorganize, to change, to reposition people, and so on. And it must be easily scalable. Scalable means if today I'm serving 10 people, if I have to serve 100 people, if I have to serve 1,000 people, if I have to serve 10,000 people, can we grow the organization? the way it is structured. Okay? So that's scalable. Right? It should be able to grow, expand. Okay? If I put a structure where it cannot grow, then it is going to limit us. Right? For example, if I just get example, suppose I am the only person making all the decisions. It's not a scalable model because as there are more people, more ministries, more decisions have to be made. And if all those decisions have to be made by me, it's practically not possible. So what do we do? We appoint leaders. We say, hey, each area of ministry, there is a ministry leader or there's a pastor. They will make all the day-to-day -day decisions, all those things. They will take care of it. Only important decisions will come to me. So then they will gain experience. Then at some point, even though, so if they're right now, if they're coming back saying for 15 decisions to me, maybe after five years, I, I can say, hey, you only bring five decisions. The remaining 10, you only do. By the time they've gained the experience, they know how to handle it. So I can push it out. And that's a scalable model, right? So you have more people, we can, and they will do the same with, uh, their team leaders and so on, so volunteer team leaders, they will delegate more responsibility. So that's a scalable model. If everything is in my control, it will not scale. It's not possible, right? Now, what are some tests of a good organization design? Like, how do we know that the design we have, the way we have structured right now is good, right? So we can ask some basic questions, some practical questions. Um, the first question we can ask is, is the organizational design, that is the structure of the organization, it is, is it aligned to the people we are serving? So that's very important. Okay? The people we are serving, who are we serving? And do we have a structure that is aligned to serve them? Right? So, example, we are a local church. ABC is a local church. Who are we serving? Well, primarily, we are serving people who are in the city, right here. So, we, example, we have an office, we have a structure to now where we are working during the day. We are not on call 24-7. Like this is not, our office is not open 24 seven. You know, we are there from morning nine to about six o'clock, seven o'clock. Everybody goes home uh, and we are working. Now, is that sufficient to care for the people? So yeah, most of the time. Because our people, there are, there are not you know emergencies every day that they have to be working 24 seven. That doesn't happen. So we are able to meet the people, but suppose, uh, the people we are serving, uh, you know, were all over the country, all over the world. And we say our office only works 9 to <laughs> Indian time, 9 to 6. And we are serving all the people. You can call us anytime for prayer. Well, that's a mismatch because there will be people in other time zones. They will call during their time, which would be evening time here. And nobody's there in the office to answer the phone. Then something is wrong. Right? 
So we would need a structure that is able to support people from different parts of the world, handle calls. I'm just giving a simple example, right? Um, but like that, you know, are we aligned to serving the people, you know, aligned to the people we're serving? Who are we serving? Are we aligned to that? Secondly, uh, does it enable people to add value and contribute meaningfully? Okay. So if the structure we have stifles people, that means people feel like, oh, I can't share my ideas, I can't come up with new things, I don't have the freedom to do something new, something different, uh, I just have to keep doing what was done 10 years ago, five years ago, or last year, I have a new idea, and they feel very stifled. The people feel they cannot contribute meaningfully, right? Or they cannot add value. Then that kind of an organization uh, is not healthy. It's not good, actually, right? because we need to let people add value. Because everybody has certain talent. They have certain new ideas, fresh ideas. Maybe it's different from the past, but they should be able to share it. They should be able to contribute. And we should be able to, you know, uh, do some new things. So does the organization facilitate that? Um, is there alignment between employee strengths uh, and, and how the organization is structured? Yeah. So that means are, are the right people in the right place? Right? Or are we just putting people randomly? Oh, you're my cousin, you're there. You're my uncle, you go there. You're my father's friend, you go there. And we're putting everybody in the places. They don't have the skills to do it. They don't have the desire to do it, but they have the position. Then, finish, nothing will happen. <laughs> They're all there, but they don't have the skills. They don't have the competencies. They don't have the interest. That's it. You know, it'll, nothing will work. Right? Uh, so, we have to is an organization design. Does it enable uh, departments units to function as they should? And in every every department, you know, function freely, efficiently. Uh, does it enable easy interactions between departments or ministries, units? Uh, is it minimalistic? Is it as flat as possible? So these are some questions that we can ask. And I've just given one simple example. Suppose. Um, there's a person, A, who does the work. And this person, A, does the work and needs to get that completed work to person, B. Right? But if there are two people in between, B and C, all they do is they forward. They receive the email from person, A, and they forward to person, he sends it to B, B just forwards that email to person C, person C just forwards it to person B. So actually, person B and person C are of no use. They're not adding any value. They're simply sitting and forwarding the email. And so they did the work, but they didn't do the work. The work was done by person A. It has to reach person D. So the simple solution is, hey, person A, email it directly to person D. That's it, just send it. Unless person B is going to add some value, like maybe they take that information, they look at it, review it, they add some comments, they add some analysis, they make some recommendations, and, and then they pass it to person, the next person, person C, person C, adds their own information to it, does something useful, and then it comes to D. Then it makes sense. But if they're just forwarding the email, it's a waste of time and waste of some two people sitting in between doing nothing. They're not adding any value, right? So what must we must do? Eliminate such kind of things. So those kind of things we'll find in government office. <laughs> this one will take the file and take it from this table and put it on this table. Then they'll take it on this table and put it on that table. Where does it have to go? It has to go to the manager. So, but it has to stop. And be, these people may not do anything. They may just put it on chapa and send it to under our stamp. And they're not adding any value to the actual content. They're not adding any value to the whole process. So what do we say? 
eliminate B and C. We don't need them. Uh, they don't need to be in this loop. Uh, you know, person A can just send it directly to person B. You know, that's just, we need to be efficient. Remove unnecessary steps in between, right? Um, there should be checks and balances uh, so that we have control uh, on, on what is happening, what's happening in the overall organization, and we want to minimize uh, waste of resources. So, of course, um, the organization design has to be, we have to think of the design that everywhere there has to be checks and balances, you know. Uh, everywhere where there is the use of people, time, and money, there has to be checks. Otherwise, people, time, and money are resources. They could be wasted. If somebody is being sent to do some work that is really not useful, then that person's time, that person is being wasted, right? Or uh, time, people's time, or resources. So everywhere, you have to intentionally put checks and balances. That, and it has to be put into the organization because one person cannot be checking everything. It's not possible. So what do you do? You put checks and balances. You tell different people, you check this, you check that, you check that, you check that. So that we have, make sure controls are everywhere throughout the organization and people, time, money, three things. People, time, money should not be wasted. You know? Sometimes we think only money. Money is important. I'm not saying no, because people have given their tithes and offerings for the work of God. So money has to be careful. But we must not forget time and people. If one person is standing somewhere full day from morning till evening, what did he do? I'm standing here and waiting. Waiting for what? Somebody to do their work. So the person who's standing and waiting, he and his time and his skills have been wasted for one whole day. He could have done something very useful for that, that whole day. He, as a resource, has been wasted. You saw we sent him on work. What work? Stand and wait. That's not work. That is a waste. You know? We can we have to stop that waste. We have to find an efficient way. Say, instead of you going there and just standing and waiting, make a phone call. If the work is done, go and pick it up. If it's not done, don't go. Use your day to do something else. See, that's a better way of making use of that person. Otherwise, that person's whole day is gone. Time and him as well him and her as a person, resources. So we have to put those checks and balances, make sure things are all going fine. And uh, number eight, which is important, is uh, the organization should be able to do some new things, new strategies. We should be able to rapidly accommodate change. Okay? So, you know, think about COVID time, you know, they had uh, 2022. Sorry, 2020, 2020, right? 2020. So suddenly something happened, which was unexpected. None of us even saw it coming. The question is, could we quickly make the changes we needed to adapt to this new environment? You know? And, uh, I can speak for ourselves, and I'm sure many other churches and organizations were able to adapt. But immediately they said, okay, you cannot have church service because gatherings are not allowed everywhere. It was not, it was not just the church. It was just sorry, but noise. It was not just the church. It was everywhere that people are not allowed to you know, gather in large numbers. So we couldn't have church. Uh, you know, all churches everywhere had to stop. So then what do you do? You go online. Okay, we'll go online. But even online, you can't come together and do the broadcast because even gathering of four or five people were you know, restricted 
So you can't even get a team together. It's okay. Now we are going to go online. So immediately, okay, we basically had to go from home or you know wherever you have to go online until you know restrictions are relaxed. Okay, now they said, okay, smaller groups, four or five people can come together, do those things. So every step of the way, we had to adapt. We have to make sure things happen. Think differently. Think work. We're still working as an organization. People are working from homes. But how can you make this happen? Yeah. So, for example, I was thinking about our children's church service. So obviously, we couldn't have children's church. Children cannot come together. But we said, okay, we can do online children's church service. But how are we going to do it? Uh, because we can't come together and record. Okay, everybody record at home. Send your your part of the video to our media person. He will stitch it, stitch it together and he will upload the video. So we immediately put a process in place. So people had gone back to their homes in different parts of the country. Fine. Every week, uh, we had one person who would write the script. This is what is coming up next week. The script for it. These are the people who will do the different post parts of it. Send it to all of them. They'll all record it at home, wherever they are. Send your video to one person. You will put it together, put the music, everything together, upload. Right? So we were able to adapt. I'm just giving one example. Right? So, uh, so there'll be different situations where we have to adapt. You know, think differently, do something different, change our schedules, whatever, whatever. And so the organization should allow us to do that. So that's a good. Uh, organization design. So these are eight questions that we can ask uh, to just see if the design we have, is it good? Is it efficient? Uh, is it uh, really going to help us? So let me pause and see if there are any questions, any questions online, any questions from those who are in class? Any, any questions so far? Yes, yes go ahead. So I've seen that in the process, yes. Yeah. So the quick good questions. The question is sometimes we have people who are part of a process who are really not adding value to the process, like we saw in the diagram. Person A is doing the work, he has to send his completed work to person D. But in the middle, there is B and C, but actually not adding any value. They just there. And but it is a waste because we have to pay their salaries. They're not really adding any value to the organization in that in that process. They are themselves being wasted. They they have talents, they have abilities, which they're not usefully contributing to the organization. They just like forwarding an email or moving a file or you know so what do we do well uh generally I, and i can just speak from what we we try to do here is we try to see if there is another place in the ministry where their skills can fit you know so okay there are two people b and c we can take out they don't need to be here in this part but is there any other place in the ministry in what we're doing where the skills that we have can we position her there and see the skills that he has? Can we position him there? Uh, will they be able to do the work? Now we can't just move them somewhere simply, but they should there should be a match. So then if that's if it's like that, then we will talk to them. And we'll talk to them politely, say, you know, thank you so much for being here, serving in this place. We'd like to move you to another role, Abed, and this is what the role is. This is what you'll be doing, but are you interested in that? Uh, if they're interested, good. If they're not interested, then we'll say, look, uh, you know, we'll have to have the difficult conversation of saying that we can't keep you, right? Because it's a waste of money. It's a waste of that person. So either you move to that role or you leave the organization. And there's nothing wrong. Uh, it is it is it is difficult, but we always have to make decisions with the best interest of the organization and the person. Right? 
the person sitting here and not doing anything, it's not good for them also. They're just sitting and not doing anything. You're wasting your life. Uh, so it's better that they go and find another job or find another ministry where they can serve, do something. Meaning, it's good for them. And it's also good for the organization because the organization will save that much money and time. And so on. so the first thought is, can we move them to another place within the organization? If there is an opportunity, then we'll talk to them. Uh, if there is no opportunity, then we have to say, you know, could you please another outcome? Now, we have a process for it. We usually have a one-month period. Uh, so we, we give them one month to look at it. In some cases, we have given them three months. Where, uh, if things, we tell them in advance, three months. But we'll give you three months to transition, to find a job, and uh, things like that. So, uh, usually, if they've been with us for a long, long time, but then we'll give them three months. Uh, but if they have, you know, they're just recent, then our, our, our standard is one month transition. Any questions from? Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yes. This is administration team. Any related to the population? Uh, are they related to the congressman and any account? Yes. Church are the Church Okay. So the question is, uh, is the administ church administration accountable to the congregation? If so, in what way? Uh, do we give them information on all the minute details? Do we do that? That's a question. And if a staff is released, uh, will they remain in the congregation or will they go somewhere else? You know, what actually happens? So uh, these are good, very good questions. So, uh, so all our, I would say almost all our church staff are people who belong to our congregation, almost all. And we always prefer hiring people who belong to the church because they have the culture, the mindset, and they're actually involved in what's happening in the church. So uh, the decisions they make are relevant to what's happening in the church. You know, so that we feel that's very important. So we usually give preference to hiring from within the congregation. But we do have people who are from other churches who are also on staff, So uh, which is fine. We don't prevent that. Uh, we give first preference to, you know, like if they have the right skills, we hire from within the congregation. But we also have hired people from other churches. Even now, we do have um, in Bangalore, in our church staff here in Bangalore, we have at least, like our in our uh, church staff, we have at least one person um, who belongs to another church. He worships in a, another place. Uh, and then we have like uh, lots of our other consultants, meaning they're not full-time staff. They do some work because they belong to other churches and other places. That's fine. So, so that's the first thing, right? Second is we do not communicate everything, all the decisions to the congregation. It's not needed. The congregation doesn't need to know all the day to day. There are so many decisions that are made, so many things we're doing, so many different ministries that are happening. Um, we don't communicate all the decisions. So how do we, uh, uh, how are we accountable to the congregation? One is, uh, of course, we make sure that we, we do everything right. We do everything internally, everything is clear. Every year, we send a year in review report. So that usually happens in the last week of December, where we send a report of all the ministries and the finances to the congregation and to our people. It's, it's an open report right? so that everybody knows 
this was what was spent in all the ministry areas financially. So once a year we do the report. Plus, uh, our financial report, audited financial report, that means it is being checked by the auditors, we put it up on our church website. That is our way of being accountable to the congregation, saying, hey, you know, this is what happened this year, and here's also the audited report that goes on the church website. Anybody can see it. Anybody can ask questions. So that's our way of being accountable. But we don't tell them all the day-to-day -day decisions, you know, hiring of staff, leaving staff. We don't. We, uh, of course, if there's a new staff, you know, uh, full-time staff, that picture will go on our website, you know, so people can see it, you know. And wherever it's needed, we will inform, especially if it's a pastoral role. Like when a new pastor comes in or the pastor leaves, uh, something like that. That at a pastoral level, we will inform. But all the other staff, we, we don't inform because they're all working inside the organization. Right. So now, when we dismiss people or people leave working from the church, uh, different things happen. Uh, some of them will stay in the congregation, though they may not be working for the church. Uh, when we release them, they continue. Some of them may move on. They, you know, if they find roles and places somewhere else, they go. That's fine. But we try to keep good relationship with everyone. You know, we there's no negative feeling because the organization has to run as an organization. We have to look at it from a very practical standpoint, and um, we try to treat everyone well. Try to treat the people well. So. I would say that not everyone stays, they move on, and we don't stop them from moving. Um, but we try to keep good relationships with people. And, and, and sometimes we've found that sometimes people leave because they go abroad. <laughs> Just even last week, uh, one of our person was working, he left, he went for Germany, went to Germany. Uh, so he was working with us. Uh, he went to Germany. It's good, it's good for him, it's his future. Uh, so like that, a lot of people who have worked with us have gone to many different parts of the world uh, and uh, they've got jobs and they're working there, which is good. It's, it's good. Okay. Any other questions? Jeff, you know, yes. Two minutes, we have two minutes, we can take up a question. Go ahead. So, just out of curiosity, uh, so you said we can make some changes in the structure. And mm -hmm. Uh, can you just, just give us an example? Like, have you made any uh, change in the structure of the other place with the organization? Mm. Yeah. So, you know, many changes. So, uh, the question is uh, you know, we were talking about how we can reorganize, we can change the organizational structure. Uh, and uh, in fact, we, we keep doing it like uh, almost every year. Uh, we keep changing, refining the organizational structure. Um, so, example, and, um, uh, and I can look at you know different departments, different areas of ministries where we changed. Uh, in fact, this last year itself, we did many changes. Uh, I'll, uh, I can mention a few. So, uh, when we came out of the pandemic, and we had to restart. All the in-person services one of the changes i mean we made many changes but one of the changes i can think of is in the children's church area pastor selena was our children's church pastor but when we restarted i said okay uh, i requested her you don't continue as a children's church pastor i'd like to have two younger people step into that role so we had uh, Karen and Sharon, they were two young people. We gave them the role of children's church pastors because uh, during the pandemic, they were the ones who were handling the online services because they were kind of more in touch with uh, technology. So when we resumed, I said, let them be children's church. So Pastor Selena will be in the background. She more, more like a mentor to them because another reason is we wanted to start raising up the next generation in that day. So they took some time to kind of settle in, learn how to do it, all that. But she was there in the background being a mentor. 
And I said, you, we gave her new responsibilities, like uh, the single adults ministry, give it to her. Uh, we gave her the women's luncheon, so okay, you handle this. Whereas the children's church, you give it to these two new younger people so they can take this one. So that is one change we made. We also made changes in the worship area. For example, Pastor Jake Ma was our worship pastor. Uh, Roshan Jonas was our youth pastor. And we shifted. We said, OK, um, uh, Roshan Jonas will take on the worship pastor role. Pastor Jay Kumar will focus on the South and two new areas, member care, and they wanted to launch a new ministry called Life Coaching. So we gave that to him. So Pastor Roshan Jonas took over being a worship pastor. And then we brought in someone new, Sam Matthews, to and the youth pastor. So here was reorganization. But it it proved so good because when Roshan Jonas took over as worship pastor. In three months, they wrote 13 new songs. Our worship team. In three months, they wrote 13 new songs. Actually, next weekend, we are recording seven new songs. Uh, sorry, four new songs, and then they'll record another three. So it just happened. And he was so passionate about it. He got the team to write new songs. Um, and then the youth ministry was just took off very well. And then we were also able to launch Life Coaching, which was a shape of So. All of these things, you know, really strengthen all these different areas, which we really needed to grow and strengthen in. But in order to do that, we had to reorganize. We had to move people in different places and change. And in, 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 we have a culture where people are open to change. It's not like, hey, I have this role, I will never move. That we don't tolerate. If you don't move, we'll send you off. <laughs> it's that, you know, so when we say there's a reason why we have to reposition people, because we do it for the with, the, with how we want the organization to grow. And just looking at it, with just these small changes, there's been so much growth uh, that's happened in all these areas. So uh, it's been good. Okay, that's a good question. I know we're over time. Uh, let's take a break. We'll go for a 10 minute break and come back. Uh, thank you. Yes.